Your dreams are bigger, bolder, and more badass than the life you're living now. But something just keeps getting in the way. Join certified coach and former therapist Diane Wingert for the Driven Woman podcast. She'll show you how to get rid of whatever is holding you back so you can stop spinning your wheels and up-level your life. Get ready to hop in and buckle up. This is the Driven Woman podcast, and we're heading for the fast lane. Well, hey, hey, hey to my fellow Driven Women. I've got something very special for you today. My guest is consultant and business strategist Rhonda Glynn, who joins me from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Rhonda is the owner of Zoma Business Solutions, and I think she's a perfect example of the fast-growing trend of first-time entrepreneurs who are both over 50 and female. Rhonda started her business as a side hustle toward the end of a long and successful career in the aviation industry. And at an age when many women are slowing down, Rhonda is just getting started. Now, I can't wait to share her with you, especially if you are a later in life entrepreneur or on your way to becoming one yourself. You're going to want to pay attention to Rhonda and I discussing how she was a born alpha that grew up in a household of men how she learned to stand out in a male-dominated industry, why the hustle culture of the Caribbean helped prepare her for entrepreneurship, and why as women age, instead of becoming invisible, as our culture tells us, why we actually need to become fearless, and how Rhonda created a powerful personal brand. You're going to want to look at the social media graphics for this episode and check out those nails. Now, You're about to discover why Rhonda has become part of my personal wolf pack. But before we get into the actual interview, I want to share with you one of my very favorite podcast reviews because it comes from fellow ADHD coach and podcaster, Tracy Otsuka, who says, Diane Wingert is the real deal. No one knows her stuff quite like Diane. This is the perfect podcast for entrepreneurs and other women working on their mindset. I love how she connects concepts in a simple, straightforward, easy to understand way with focused inspiration to ensure you live to your full potential. Tracy, I know you know this, but you are my ADHD soul sister and I adore you. Now, one last thing before we get into the interview. Podcasters need to know what their audiences love hearing from them so that we can make sure our content is spot on. So I want to make it easy for you. I'm working on a special series of podcast episodes on mindset blocks and more importantly, how to overcome them. So I've created a poll for you called What's Holding You Back? It's quick and easy. You will need to enter your email address to give me the feedback. And that means you'll be added to my email list and will hear from me until you decide to unsubscribe. But this way, I'll be able to create the perfect podcast content just for you. You want to get over those mindset blocks, don't you? Of course you do. So don't forget to click on that link in the show notes. And now, alpha female, badass entrepreneur, business strategist, Rhonda Glynn. Enjoy. Today on The Driven Woman, I have the unique pleasure of inviting my new friend from all the way on the other side of the planet, almost from Trinidad and Tobago, Rhonda Glynn. Rhonda and I met a few months ago on Instagram through a mutual connection, and I was immediately captivated by her presence, her strength, her drive, her intensity, and her sheer unbridled badassery was captivating. I had to know this woman. We went on to connect on Zoom, and I knew it was a must that she would join us on The Driven Woman. Today is that day. Rhonda, I can't wait to dive into a very powerful conversation. Welcome. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. Here we are, and we I, I got to tell everybody listening, one of the things that you and I realized we had in common in our first conversation was that we are both what I like to call late 
to the party entrepreneurs. So tell everyone listening a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey, your business, Zoma Business Solutions, and where you are in the process right now. Okay, so thank you, Diane, and thank you for that big welcome. I do appreciate it. Um, I've been in, I've always wanted to get into consulting. I come from a family of teachers and lawyers, so it was expected that I would either be a teacher or a lawyer, and I fought against that for a long time. However, I realized that I'm very good with people. I think really, really fast, and I'm very, very detail-oriented. As I said before, in our earlier conversations, I've spent like 29 years in aviation. I have been an instructor, course developer, national security researcher, supervisor. So I ended up in the business of guiding, mentoring, and helping people. And remember, aviation is service-based. So And mostly men, And right? mostly men. And I have a degree in security management as well. So my first degree was in security management. So I have worked in male-oriented societies, and I'm an only girl. So when it came time for me to think what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, then it was a natural progression that aviation kind of pushed me in this direction. And I embraced the whole situation of giving guidance and helping people. Now, Zoma Business Solutions is a small consultancy firm. I work primarily with female entrepreneurs because for entrepreneurs, for business, mindset is key. Yes. You can teach people anything. Anything else is tools. I could teach you anything else, how to brand yourself, how to do a business plan, how to get yourself together, how to put the best face on your business, all of those things. But if your mindset is not there, then all of it is a waste of time. So that is what I primarily do. I work with small business owners and startup companies to help them to get out of their own way mm. and start and start to invest in their business. Now, the nice thing about female entrepreneurship, which I'm why I'm so drawn to it, is because female entrepreneurship is the wave of the future. I can't agree more. Yep, it is. It is. And especially for my region, because Latin America and the Caribbean is one of the highest percentages of female entrepreneurship right now in the world. Why so is for, that? Tell me why. I think there's, there's a cultural part of it. We have always seen women working outside of the home, or even if they were working in the home, there was always an income generation. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with our historical background of being a colonized people. Yes, and the mix of how many other people from all over the world have gravitated towards the Caribbean. So being entrepreneurial is natural to Caribbean people and especially Caribbean women. But we didn't used to think of it as entrepreneurship. We used to think of it as a hustle. Oh. And a lot of, yeah, we used to think of it as a hustle. In a good so, way or a bad way? Because, of course, you can say, well, she really hustles, meaning she's always working. She's always generating ideas. She's always industrious. She's always looking for a way to make a buck. Or you can think of somebody hustling you like a con artist. I know, but it was always about bringing income to the home. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is that hustle, whether it's good or bad, is hard. And when children, when early stage entrepreneurs became adults or had adult age children, they didn't want them to have that same experience. So they invested in education and children would go to school and get degrees and become, get that permanent government job that was the cherry on top of the pie. Okay, I, I have they, to ask you a question. And they never have to work so hard. But see, this is so fascinating to me, Rhonda, because you've just told me that culturally it, entrepreneurship is natural, that the desire to be industrious and driven and hardworking and money motivated is just natural, especially for women. But there's also a cultural narrative that... Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be necessary. If you have to hustle, you hustle. But the the best way, the better way is to get the education, to get that corporate job, to get the benefits and to do that. You did one and then you did the other. You came all the way back around to entrepreneurship. Now that you're at this stage, do you think it's necessary to do the corporate work first 
why not just go straight to entrepreneurship as a young adult? I think two reasons. One, and you may or may not agree with me, but I um, I went back to school when I was 40 years old. So prior to 40, mm -hmm. I had four O levels. I did not have a full college certificate. I did not. Okay. Did that limit but you? It limited me to the extent where it was unfinished business mm -hmm. because I, because I've been on my own since I turned 21. Mm -hmm. So it me meant therefore that had my trajectory been different, I probably would not have been in the job at all. I probably would not have gone into avi the aviation field at all, but I'm saying here's the good and the bad about it. The good of it is that I think I have always had the ability to critically think. Having a university education has sharpened that ability. Mm. So you always, people think that you go to school or you get qualified to get that degree, that piece of paper. You are going to forget almost three quarter of the modules that you were taught in uni. The thing that you learn in university or at tertiary level education is how to critically think, mm. how to invest in data how to make a decision, all right, it could be a gut decision, but it is bolstered up by data, by analysis, by testing, by everything else that you bring into the table. So you bring in the whole picture. But here's the thing. Women realized that they were sold a bill of goods because they were told that if they got to university and if they got to the top of their classes and won all the awards and got summa cum laude and all the all the bells and whistles, that they would go to the job, whatever job it was, and they would be recognized for this mm, talent. Mm, mm. And that at some future day, people would say, you know what, Diane, you are so good that you ought to be CEO of this company. And between you and I and the corner, that's a piece of bullshit. Don't we know it? And I think you're, it, it's sort of like when I think about, I don't know if you have been exposed to all the Disney movies, but I just think about the Disney movies and the Barbie dolls and the, the narrative. I know, no, 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 no. I know the, the, whole, <laughs> the whole feminine conditioning. But what we're talking about really is this notion that if you are a good girl, if you follow the rules, if you do the work, if you make the top grades, you will be noticed, you will be singled out, you will be rewarded. So basically, following the rules and being the best will automatically mean you will be singled out and rewarded for that. And it, it really completely excludes the mindset of ambition, motivation, initiative, resiliency, and basically raising your hand and saying, here's why you should pick me and not taking no for an answer, which men are absolutely encouraged. And in, in our culture insists that they develop those traits. But women, oh, no, we're just supposed to be good and fold our hands and wait to be picked. Okay. And I totally agree with you. But so here's what's ha what has happened to a lot of women. At one end of the scale, that's the 20 to 35 category. By the time they get to 35, they realize, you know what? I'm not going to be CEO of this company. And I most likely will have to, to train some man who is going to get the job. So I have a choice to make. Either I start to look in another direction mm. or I'm going to have to pull my big girl panties up and jump ship. So that is what is causing entrepreneurship on the one. On the young, the younger, the young professionals, the, the early, right. the early career females. Okay. So now we have the other part of that scale where the women who have been conditioned by society that they should be good little girls and now they are in their 40s and early 50s, and they realize that if I don't do it now, I'm going to miss my chance. Yes. It's like so the, the window of opportunity is sliding shut, and they realize it's now or never. No, not only that. They realize because we come to 
we mature by the the battles that we fight and win, mm -hmm. not just by the calendar years. Mm -hmm. So they realize that this piece of BS that we were fed all this, this means nothing. I am as good as everybody else, if not better. I am going to jump ship. I am going to go for it. Because if I don't go for it, then here's the frightening thing. I'm going to look back at a life that is filled with regrets and what ifs, and I will not be able to live with myself at that point in time. So I am going to go for it. So you have two sets of women at two different scales of their lives who are jumping out. Because I've been both women, I want all of them to come to me mm -hmm. because I want to tell them that it is all right not to know everything. It is all right to fail. It is all right to be afraid. It is all right to be uncertain about something. It is all right to make a mistake and try something and it didn't work and you pivot and you tweak and you adjust. Or change your growing. mind. Even if, you, change even if mind. you are successful at something, you could literally just say, I'm really good at this. I'm being paid well for it. I actually enjoy it. But I simply choose to do something else. But we also have to represent for the older women, the women mm -hmm. who That's are at retirement age who say, I don't have any grandchildren to bounce on my knee, or even if there are grandchildren, that's not how I want to spend my senior years. I'm going to start a business now that I'm in retirement because I see a lot of those ladies rising exactly. up too and saying, "Who, who's to say that there is an upper age limit on first-time entrepreneurship? And here's the other thing. Here's another, and this is a deep conversation. Here's the other thing. Women of a certain age are almost, they almost become invisible. Mm. The society doesn't see them anymore. Where would we have been in 2020 if there wasn't the Dove campaign that saw beauty in all different colors and all different shapes and at all different ages? How many times have we gone to boutique or a high-end store or even a low-end store and you do not see clothes over size 10. It's so true. How, how is it in this society that we do not see menopause as a thing, as a real thing? Because ma menopause comes with aches and pains and everything. Or we don't want to talk about it because it somehow signifies that we're getting older. And we certainly don't want to admit to that. And not only that. Here's the thing about a woman of a certain age. She is a walking repository of, as I said, battles won and lost, experience on the workplace, being the silent, the invisible hand in many corporate areas where she has been behind the scenes making shit happen and the men have been taking the accolades. This, these are the women who have all the knowledge and they are telling themselves, I cannot go to my grave or I cannot go to grow orchids and plant gardens at this stage in my life where there is so many things that I still want to do. And these women are jumping out. And that is, could only be a good thing. It's up, You know what? I have, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you. One is, do you think there is a fundamental difference between women who are content with being the power behind the man, because there are millions of women mm -hmm. who are very comfortable being Mrs. Dr. Somebody or Mrs. CEO somebody, and they do not aspire to have their own business, their own consultancy, their own coaching business. They, they are very content to know that their husband or partner wouldn't be where he is and who he is if it were not for them. And then women like us who say, mm -hmm. you know, I want my own thing. Do you think there's okay, a fundamental so difference between the two types of women? Both, both choices are fine. Both choices are excellent choices. There was a guy, there is a guy who's a very good friend of mine who told me something once, and I never forgot it. He said that there are some men that like to lead and there are some men who like to be led. Mm. And, a wise, and a wise woman must know which man she's with. I like that. And that is the fact of it. Some men like to lead and some men like to be led. If you flip that idea, there are some women who are going to run with the wolves. And there are some women who are very comfortable in the space 
of being part of the bigger picture. Being part of the pack, if you will. Exactly, yeah. exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Because we cannot all be alpha. I would. I think I was born alpha. Yes, I I'm, I'm pretty I, sure you were. <laughs> I, I, I have no. I have no fear. I, I have a brother who says that I am one of the most determined people that he has ever met, and and it comes from, I guess, being in a house of men. It could have. I think that, I mean, you know, that, you know that I was a, I was a psychotherapist for a very long time. And one of the things, I I, know. one of the things I studied was birth order and, mm-hmm. and also the impact of the composition of the family on personality. So mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I can't say for certain, but it's very likely that being the only girl mm-hmm. in the household of all that male energy Your personality was absolutely shaped. But here's something I'm dying to know. All my life, Mm -hmm. I was told I'm intimidating or I'm threatening or I'm too bossy. And those traits are not desirable. And so, I mean, I was even just a teenager when I first started being told. And I started thinking, why is this? Is it because Mm -hmm. I'm tall? Well, some people are intimidated when you're taller than them. Is it because I'm intelligent? That could be it. Is it because I'm outspoken? Is it because I'm educated? Is it because I'm not bad looking? What is it? And, And why is it a problem? I know for a fact, you too, because we've talked about this. Okay. I like that. I like that. I'll tell you, I'll give you a little story. When I look back at my life, because I'm 57 now, I, I grew up in a house where there were, I started to read very early. Mm-hmm. My father, my father is a teacher. My mother is very literate. My grandfather was a school principal. So by the time I was five years old, I was reading way above my age group. When people were reading um, fairy stories, I was reading hard stuff. Mm. I remember I was 11 and I was reading Love Sang Rampa and the Third Eye. I read everything because there was no such thing as off-limit mm. books in my home. We read everything. My mother would buy every newspaper. So there would be the morning edition, the times, the this, the that. And when I became a teenager... My mother would buy me Time magazine. I would get In Style magazine. I would get Vogue and another mag every month. We were reading every some of month. the same magazines years before we yeah. knew each other. So as a result, it expands your mind when you are reading. Mm-hmm. So when okay. I was having conversations with people, I would have conversations with people who were much older than me. Mm-hmm. And we would, dis- we would discuss ideas and thoughts and perspectives. And there were no sacred cows in my house. We would discuss everything. There was not a question. Now, you, you, no, you don't talk about that. You're too small to have an opinion. So I was always curious and I remain curious up to now. So I didn't fit into the box. Mm. And I think having a brain that was so well developed at a younger age, I was encouraged to have conversations I think that in itself is what made me become so forceful. However, it meant that boys were intimidated by me. That was in high school. Oh, I, I, to, to this day, to this day, I do not have a lot of close female friends because of that same thing. Now, as I'm getting older, they say that like is attracted to like. So wolves recognize wolf. So most of my female friends would be wolf-like. You want to be accepted. You want to fit in. But you're, you're such an alpha. It's very hard to just exactly. fit in, isn't it? So that, but it, but it worked against me at a point in my life because it is a natural human thing to socialize, to have friends, to be part of the group. And it was difficult. It was difficult for them to accept me because I didn't fall into the same categories. But as I become older, I've accepted that I am who I am, flaws Mm -hmm. and all, and I love me. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. These are the things that fascinate me. I am naturally curious. I, I, because I was a course developer, I read really, really fast and I can assimilate information really fast. Even on Instagram, people would think about 
about consistency and thing. I did a post today about um, this movie, The Kitchen, with the three women oh, who are yeah, monster wives so and good. took over their husband. It's a great movie. Yeah, that is a fantastic ma- and there, oh. and there are so many allegories in life when women, when women are put into hot water, how they can adapt and how strength grows from just doing no things question. that are not natural to you. And you will get good at it. And women are good at adaptation. So, yeah, now I accept it. And now I'm very, I'm very understanding of the fact that um, yes. I ruffle feathers. And I accept it. I don't want, in, in the beginning, I think in my 20s and 30s, I I kind of couldn't understand why they would treat me like if I was the bitch. But now I understand it. So I kind of like laugh at it because when I walk into a room, especially yes. with my nails. Now, of course, this I, is a podcast. It's not YouTube. So what, what the listeners cannot see is that Rhonda... Oh my God, Fantastic Rhonda! Man. I will make sure that they show in in the uh, in the social media that we are going to do to promote this episode. Your nails are stunning. They, they're like you got to say how long are they? They're going to be two and a half inches long or something like that. And not only that, they're not press on. As fast as I have a very good nail tech, and if you notice, my nails are brand new. Yes. That's so, the, every, they're, they're totally on every time <laughs> I see you, you are so consistent with your branding. It, it, it's not uh-uh. just the logo and the, the business uh, color scheme. You are the brand. I it is a my brand. brand. You are your brand. And every time I see you, you are on brand. Mm-hmm. And that's the aviation background right there. I love it. So I've, I've, I've gotten more comfortable with it. I act- you are who you are, but Not it's, only that, you're, you're- I, I laugh at it because sometimes I will walk into a room and I almost feel that I, I feel like they look look at me from up from yes. head to toe and they're like I call, I call that the Terminator scan. Yeah. If you ever saw the movie <laughs> The Terminator, when the Terminators come, they usually arrive naked. I just saw the latest movie <laughs> the other night. They arrive naked in this ball of light and they they look around to find some human that has the same proportions because they need to take their clothes so they can walk around. And I call it the Terminator scan when I walk into a room and other women kind of look me up and down. It's not my clothes they're interested in, but it's not a friendly thing. It's kind of their literally sizing you up and making a judgment that used to hurt me yeah it used to piss me off yeah. now it amuses the hell out of me yeah because you know what it just goes to show you how powerful women are and how yes. we, and how we sit in our power and not yes. and not and not just like the terminator not put on the clothes of power and say yeah this is me this is who I am. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to shrink. I no. take up space. You take up I space. I take space. I know that. I remember going in a conference and as I, I got, got to the conference, a woman's conference late and I walked into the room and I could almost feel women like, where did this bitch come out? And, and it, Who does she think she I is? Who does she think she is? And, but in my mind, I say, you know what, after a while, they will realize that the bitch doesn't bite and then people will come across and they will talk to me and whatever. And in that conference, I have made lifelong friends because they were so blown away by the fact that I, I take up space. I'm not coming in shrinking. I am, no. talk, I, I am not doing this. This is my life. As long as I am in this place, I am going to take up space. It is it's just such, who I am. It is who you it. In truth, even though I've only known you a few months, it is who you have always been. Mm -hmm. But but when we don't feel self-conscious about it, when we don't question it, when we don't think, should I really be so bold as to think I could start my own business in my 50s? We are not held back or limited by the doubt, by the worry, by the fear by the need for others' approval, mm-hmm. at some point you think, well, fuck it. Exactly. You know, like, what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work out. If I don't do it, it's for sure not going to work out. So I might as well do it. And that is my point, because I recently did a poll on Instagram and I asked, do you overthink? And at least 10 women said that they do. And overthinking is one of our, is almost like a 
a millstone around our necks. We are too so con- we are too concerned about what other people think of us. And the truth of the matter is that people think of you for five minutes of their day because they have their own paranoias and their own worries and their own frustrations. And you- They're too busy worrying about what you think of them. And not only that, they have their own shit that they're dealing with anyway. So as much as you would like to think that you are all this important, that people are wasting time thinking mm-hmm. about you, that is not true. However, it doesn't mean that you must kneel for other people to walk, nor should you accept or condone toxic behavior in anybody. It doesn't matter who. In anybody. And those are the things that we have to do. Those are the boundaries that we have to set so that we can live our fullest life because we keep making apologies for ourselves. Like, you know, I'm so sorry that I'm like this. And we like to say this word, sorry. And when, mm-hmm. and when we are not sorry, we, we didn't do anything to feel sorry in the first place. So why I love are that. we I love apologizing? We... Oh, it's true. It's women, women apologize for taking up space they apologize for having opinions that might not be popular mm-hmm. they and it's like wait a second i haven't done anything wrong so why am i apologizing that's why i love the hashtag sorry not sorry mm-hmm. and use it all the time because i think it's a habit i think all of this all of this stuff that you and i talk with our clients about all of the things that you and I recognize hold them back, have at times held us back, the procrastination, the perfectionism, the people pleasing, the apologizing, the hiding, the overthinking, all of that is serving one purpose. To keep to us. keep you in to keep you in fear and to keep you stuck. to hold you back to keep you, to keep stuck. you stuck to keep you small to keep you silent because what's the worst thing that could happen if you decide I'm gonna be that coach I'm gonna be that consultant I'm going to start my little business I'm going to start charging people mm-hmm. for the value that I create in the world really. What is the worst thing that could possibly happen? If they're not paying you what you are worth, they are not the clients that you need. I have a friend who lives in Jamaica and she said, you know what, Rhonda, you are not everybody's client. And that is all right. That is Mm -hmm. quite okay. I'm not selling ice cream. (laughs) Not everybody (laughs) likes ice cream either for that matter. Some people are lactose intolerant and even if they can't have ice cream, they (laughs) want ice cream. But my point is this. It is all right for me not to be everybody's cup of tea. But if an entrepreneur wants to step out of their own way and to become successful, I would definitely tell them that I am one of the women that they need to speak to. So let's be very specific. Zoma Business Solutions, your business. Who is your ideal client? Because I have no doubt there are people listening that are thinking, damn, that lady really knows her stuff, and I bet she could get me to go places mm-hmm. because you are a badass, you are a leader, and I think there are women who absolutely need exactly what you have. So who is the perfect client for you, the kind of people that you really enjoy working with the most, and what services do you provide them? Okay, first of all, I like women who are willing to invest in themselves. I tell people, if you don't have money to invest, you must have, you must invest time. People Mm -hmm. think that the only thing that you have to have to succeed in business is money. We're living in the digital age, a quick search of the internet. You will find at least five freebies before you, your mouse click to something else. So I am saying that if you don't have the money, you must be able to invest the time. So that's the first thing. The Mm. second thing is you must have a vision of where you want to be in the future. And that vision has to be clear. You have to know that where you are is not where you want to be. 
I could have. I could. Do you have. do you help them clarify their vision? Because I think there's a lot of women who know they don't want to be where they are, know they want to have their own business, have some notion about how it would look, but mm-hmm. probably need some help with developing it into a real business idea. Is that part of what you do too? And that is part of what I do. I use my one-on-one coaching sessions as almost as a diagnosis. You know, like when you go to a G, you go to a GP before you go to a specialist. So we we unearth, we do a lot of unearthing of where your business needs to be, where you need to be in the one-on-one sessions. And then by the one by the time we get to the second or third one-on-one session, we start to do strategies. So one of the things you make may come out of a one-on-one session would be rebranding your company. So we may we'll do that. Or maybe all you need is a one-page business plan that will set you on the road to where you're going. Or Mm -hmm. you may have a business already, but you can't understand why you're not selling units of whatever as fast as you need to. It could be that your strategy is off. Or Or your positioning, your message. Um, You don't know who you're selling to, so we may want Mm -hmm. to do avatar development. We may want to do your customer, map your customer journey. We will definitely be looking at data because I am data driven. This Otherwise, is Otherwise you're just guessing. <laughs> yeah, this is this is about it. And the other thing is you have to understand what the operational environment actually looks like. And that's why when we talked earlier, I said that business is neither male nor female, it is just business. But women have a particular superpower that they're not maximizing, and that is the ability to tap into people's emotional triggers. That Mm. is a skill set that men don't have. That is a skill set that women have. And that is a superpower that we have not been using in the business of business. That is such a good point because so many things that women do naturally well, because they do them naturally well, they take them for granted which means they do not recognize them as assets that can serve them in business. Exactly. But you really you really help your clients identify what those assets are and put them to work Ex- for the business. Exactly, because there are little things. Remember, in business, we are not selling a product or a service. We are solving a problem. You see that idea of you selling, you have to sell 10 units, that transactional mindset. Mm -hmm. It is harder to get customers than to retain customers. What you're looking for is customers that will bring customers just like the customers you already have. Right. And though you want your customers to become evangelists for your brand, you want if they're having a conversation somewhere with somebody and somebody asks for a good or a service, your name must be the name that comes up. Those are things that women are already good at. However, they have not been maximizing it because as you rightly said, they take these things for granted. So things as simple as packaging a product in such a way that it brings joy to the person. Thinking about how can I please somebody? How can I make them happy? I'll give you a good example. I bought something. I'm, from I'm looking at a good example. The way, I mean, you, you, the can way visually, you, you can visually see it. The way you are packaged, mm-hmm. your whole presentation being on brand, you are dressed, accessorized in your brand colors. You have, you are conveying a confident, powerful feminine and strong image and you will attract people who want those things for themselves and reflect it in their business so i'm just thinking like you've got the package going on right there and that's my point even before you open your mouth and that is my point so i'm saying that that is the ace that most female entrepreneurs already has This is the ace in the game. This is the skin in the game that female entrepreneurs have. However, they don't recognize it because they're not equipping themselves with a mindset for success. You must want to be successful. You must see yourself successful. You must see yourself getting better at whatever you do. 
your only competition is the person that you was yesterday, the person that you was a year ago, but the person that you're aspiring to become is the person five years down the road. And you have, and, this and is it's all, all mindset. mindset. It is all, all mindset. mindset. It is all mindset. So Because with that mindset, the one you are speaking from, the mm-hmm. one you and I share and talk about, it's really, it's what's going to propel you forward regardless of the goods, regardless of the services, regardless of how saturated the market is, regardless of the economy, regardless of the pandemic. If you have that mindset of belief and confidence and determination and the willingness to learn from every failure, as opposed to thinking failure means you're making a mistake and you should go back to your J-O-B. I mean, I have a question for you, and I and I know that we're coming to the end of our time together, and I, I want to be able to tell the audience about your rebranded podcast that is probably by the time this is released going to be out again. But I have a question for you. Do you think that any woman can be yes, an entrepreneur? Yes, the choice is hers. The choice is hers. Women have unlimited power. God has blessed us with the ability to create, to rise almost Phoenix-like from every situation. When you get to our age, we're the sum total, as I always say, of everything that we've conquered, every battle that we've fought and won, every time that somebody did not Mm. believe in us and we only had ourselves, every corner that we found ourselves in and had to fight our way out of it, Every disappointment, whether it was losing a baby, losing a husband, losing a job. Um, People make the assumption, Diane, that you have to be confident to make it. You have to, you are afraid and you go forward. This is it. People feel that entrepreneurship, that entrepreneurs are not scared. We are scared shitless, but we are, but we accept the fact that we are scared. No what? <laughs> no what? This is the difference, I think. I, I can't agree with you more, Rhonda. I think the difference is that we confuse mm-hmm. confidence and courage. Confidence is not, I know this business will be successful. Nobody How could you that. possibly know that? But you can, you can be confident in your own ability to be adaptable, to be resilient, to be resourceful, to take initiative, to keep trying no matter how many times you fail. You can have confidence in that. It may not be attached to the correct business model or the correct market or the correct client avatar. Those things can all be changed and fixed. But courage doesn't mean you're not scared. Courage means you're going to do it even though you're scared. That is it. Even to the point where you might be feeling oh, exactly. sick to your stomach and you can't and you can't sleep and you have headaches and you have panic attacks, going but you're still you are going, going forward. forward. And I think I think it's like our own brain tells us that if we are feeling anxious, if we are feeling nauseous, if we are feeling scared shitless, that means we're doing no. the wrong thing. No, it doesn't. I'll give you that's a, just a thought error. You can you can be scared I'll and keep going. Story. We do it every day. I have a friend when I was doing my master's degree, I had to do a foreign internship because I had to work in three airports in the United States and then I'd worked in a cargo company in Trinidad. And I met a guy who became a mentor. And he said something to me. He said, Rhonda, you could complain about everything that you don't get the right breaks and things don't happen with you. Or you're going to have to accept those things and you are going to have to bungee jump. He said, entrepreneurship is like this. You run to the edge of the cliff, you Mm -hmm. dive off and you make that parachute while you're on the way down. And he has been in business 45 years. And Diane, I remember when he said it, I was scared. But you know what? Taking risk requires practice. Yeah. The first time you take a risk, the second time you take a risk. And by the time you realize you've been taking your 15th, 20th, 40th risk, and then risk gets comfortable. And it gets comfortable in saying that 
I do not mm. know where this is going, how this is going to turn out, but I know that I am capable of going with the flow. And uh, here's the thing. 2020 has been the year of a lot of sadness, but a lot of change. And uh, if you've survived 2020, when so many other people no longer with us, Take this as an opportunity to say, you know what? How can I become the very best version of myself? Take some time for yourself and start to have conversations with yourself. Write things down. I, I always teach my people when I was an instructor, if you don't write it down, it never happened. Take some time and have some conversations with yourself. On my website, I have a blog called How to Write a Love Letter to Yourself. So mm. I would want to suggest that they do that. Fall in love with yourself a little bit. Figure out that it's all right not to be perfect and not to be every version of other people's expectations. And then determine how you're going to show up. I love it. I will link to that blog post in the show notes as well. I love being able to direct people to something actionable and the timing is perfect. Thank you, my friend. I know they have loved this and... uh, I can't wait to keep this going. Yeah, definitely we will keep in touch. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I feel like you are my sister from another mother. Indeed. All right, my love. Be well, my friend. Bye. Bye. Hey, it's Diane. Can I be honest with you? At the beginning of each new year, I always told myself, this is the year I'm going to get my habits dialed in. This is the year I'm going to be crystal clear about my goals and I'm going to crush them. This is the year I'm going to get my shit together on every level and I'm going to do it all by myself. Been there, done that, got a whole stack of t-shirts. But you know, it wasn't until I started working with my own coach that I realized what a difference it makes to have guidance, support, and accountability from someone who's not only like-minded, but like-brained. Yeah, I'm talking about another driven woman, entrepreneur, who also has ADHD and has got it going on. I have two openings in my signature one-on-one 12-week coaching program, and one of them might have your name on it. There's a link to a free consult with me in the show notes If you think this might be the year that you really get serious and go all in on an ADHD friendly business and life, while you're thinking about that, have a listen to what one of my client's success stories has to say about the difference it made to work with me. It's funny because at first I said I would never own my own practice. And now I own my own practice. And I would say, um, I'm never going to take it any more than just treating patients. <laughs> and now I'm thinking about um, how can I start my own um, institute? You know, yeah, exactly. Even like training other therapists, having a, a certification with my name that I am, you know, I haven't thought of the name yet, but I'm certified in this technique or whatever the case may be. And really just helping other therapists help their patients the way I help mine. You've been listening to the Driven Woman Podcast with Diane Wingert. Want more straight talk and strategy each week that will take you from spinning to winning? Don't forget to hit subscribe in your podcast player so you won't miss a single episode. Then head on over to the Driven Woman free and private Facebook group community. See you there.